Cool. So I think uh, quite excited for you guys to unleash the beast now today for the rest of the afternoon. And um, you know, KTM is not a company that likes to look back. We uh, don't focus on the past. However, with this model, we thought, and the celebration of 30 years of Duke, we thought it really important to understand where this model has come from. So let's kick off with the timeline first. So in 2006, we introduced the first KTM 990 Super Duke. This model was released as a prototype a couple of years before this at the Intermot show in Germany, but this was the first production model. 2007 saw the introduction of the R version of the 990, and uh, well, 2008 we did a CTG, which is color trim and graphic update on the standard 990. Moving to 2009, we did a technical update to the R version, which is to conform with the EU homologation regulations. Well, 2010, another CTG update on the 990. 2011 was no difference on the 990, a new color, and then a, another technical update again with the EU homologation regulations on the R model. 2014 was a massive year for us because this changed sort of the shape of what we knew the naked market to be and created its own new or a benchmark in one of the most powerful torque motors uh, in the world. And the beast we pride ourselves on being the torque beast. We are not too stressed. Obviously, we've got to understand horsepower, but we're, not, we're more worried about that torque. The torque is where, where you ride the motorcycle and makes it a lot easier to ride. 2016, we introduced a special edition for the first time, while 2017 saw a light facelift on the R model. The 2019 was a color trim and graphic update, while 2020 brought in a brand new evolution of what Super Duke was, so it was the Beast 3.0. 2021, we introduced the RR model for the first time. This also received a CTG or color trim and graphic update in 2023. But 2022 was the introduction of our EVO model, which is a derivative of the R version featuring the semi active technology suspension. But before we dive into what is the, the new 3090 Super Duke R and R EVO, I'd like to call up Jeremy. Jeremy, you've been involved with uh, this project for about 14 years and uh, are pretty much one of the top guys responsible for what these guys will get to ride today. But I'm quite interested before we dive quite deep in what your first. How, how did we get in touch with you in the beginning and come to learn of your involvement in the first Super Duke 1290 R project? I'd, I'd done a little bit with KTM before uh, getting involved with the Super Duke. You know, I helped a little bit in IDM test with their test program when they were intent on winning the German Championship with an RC8, which they, they achieved. Uh, I've done a little bit with magazines, basically comparison tests and stuff, and setting up the RC8 at that time. But I guess that I got a phone call to say, could you fly to Tenerife? And, uh, we have something that we want you to look at. Okay, what is it? Of course, we're so inquisitive, we want to know why you're going to fly all the way to Tenerife. It must be pretty special. And they said, uh, no, just, just go there. You'll understand when you get there. That sort of cloak and dagger, all kind of James Bond. We yeah, had to go up into the mountains, into this little hidden finca, and met the team, and like a little underground uh, workshop, they unveiled this uh, pr pure prototype. So basically, uh, one of only one in the world. Something that they were considering. Maybe hadn't even decided at this time whether it would ever launch, but go and test it and give us some feedback. Of course, the first time you see a, a 1290 shoehorned into a into a, a, a naked bike, you know, with very, very little else attached to it, there's no electronics, it's only got a fuel cell with a tank cover on it, it's, uh, it's pretty raw and ready. And uh, they said, go, go test it, give us some feedback. First time you ride, it's like, wow, this is insane. What, will we ever see this on the street? Or is it too much, you know, what, uh, what's, what's the next step with this? Because I love some aspects of it. I love that torque, I love how it handled. 
Loved the single set of swinging on the first time I saw it. Uh, lots of little aspects that you know, we'd never seen on a naked bike before. And from that point on, then, three or four weeks later, they phoned me back and said, okay, if those parts you don't like, you know, come down and give us some, basically give us your feedback and what would you change. And it's very, very good. They give, give, basically said, you change what you want on that. We'll tell you whether you can have it or whether you can't have it. And that's, that's how that development process started. So it was, uh, it was an honor to be you know, the first person to, to ride on it. And then I'm honored to still be here today working on what is a very refined version of that very first prototype. I mean, for me, at that time of, of when this model was brought to life, the 1290, the first one, I was part of the media space, and I know that um, in a lot of countries around the world, this one bike of the year in many places, so it really did create quite a bit of waves. But fast forwarding a little bit to this year, we now have quite a lot of talking points, but I think let's strip back a little bit and start at what is the, the biggest talking point for us in terms of technology, and that's the cam shift. Why would we put a cam shift into a motor like this? Yeah, very good question. I think just because the KTM can, and they do, you know, they do things that are not, don't really quite follow the norm. You know, why, why do we need more torque than a 1290 Super Jugar? It's kind of, you know, we've already got 140 Newton meters. It's already way ahead of all of the opposition by a long way. What Gareth was alluding to earlier, you know, that's what makes the ride fun. Is it is something that produces torque? The horse part number is really pretty insignificant. It's how the bike produces its mid range, and this technology produces even more. So it's like a five five newton meter step up with the tem uh, step cam uh, or the cam shift technology, and you know that is very noticeable when you first jump off. So we're, we're comparing 1290, which jump on the 1390. What's the difference? Well, first time I rode it, it was like, oh, wow, this is like another step again. It's, it's a huge difference. And of course, the reason why, another reason why they would introduce is because of homologation rules. So with lower RPM, we can meet those uh, those emission laws that are yeah. quite strict with Euro 6, etc. But once we reach that 5,750 number, you can very quickly understand that what, what the cam shift does and you'll feel that today when you ride it. Yes, I mean, it, it, we've spent quite a lot of time on it. There's a couple of things that are really interesting for me. Obviously, firstly, it's an electronically actuated cam shift, but... Yeah, you can hear it. You yeah. can hear it. I mean, that's yeah. another big thing, it's, especially while banked over. If you're around that 6,000 sort of red range, you'll, you'll hear it uh, changing. At full in angle, you'll... Um, uh, you'll definitely hear it. Sounds like something is rattling on the bike, and that's actually the cam busy moving. It's just a clip from open to yeah. close, you know. Yeah. And if you're toying with the throttle, of course, it'll have, it'll have to close again. Yeah. yeah. Again, I would suggest you try to keep it open. See how you see how it's <laughs> it's it's it makes it fast left. Right? Yeah, it makes it faster. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, don't back out of it. <laughs> <laughs> and moving on to to the rest of the motor, we uh, obviously have increased our bore. We've increased a lot of body size, but um, looking at, yeah. you know, you guys have obviously spent quite a, a number of years. I mean, this project kick-started in early, late 2021, early 2022, and the motorcycle we ride today is super refined in terms of the, the feedback to the rider on the motor. But it wasn't like that on your first initial no, test. Yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, first initial test was a bit of a, let's just say, a, an eye-opener, you know, the... First time I rode this with a camshaft, it, of course, again, it's a prototype. We put it out at Renault on track, and made it look like a 1290, you know, so nobody knew what it was. But, you know, the guys in the Panagalli soon, soon started asking questions, because now you're passing bikes that we weren't passing on 1290s. You know, it's, it puts it into sports bike, uh, you know, com competitive levels. You know, we were, uh, our, our fastest ever lap time, was achieved on this by Gap Bruno. Um, and the first time it was Gareth was asking us, you know, what was it like? Again, it's a prototype with no electronic aids. And when the, the cam shift came in the first time I felt it, it was like a like another level. It was like you know, liking it to riding the 500 cc MotoGP bike, you know, back there in, in the days on two strokes when we had that power band. Because that's exactly what it did. 6,000 RPM. We have this this huge step of, of, of 
horse bar or, or sort of torque. And you know, I quite quickly came back in again. I was loving it, but I came back back in and said, all right guys, this, this is crazy. We gotta like, we we'll have to control this a little bit. We need some, we need our EFI guys here. We need our throttle map guys here. We need some way of making this just less aggressive whenever the camshaft came in. But it was a lot of fun on track and we even had fun with our Moto2 team. I was able to catch our, Moto, our test Moto2 team up, Bruno, because I had the advantage of having one day before they turned up. So I catch up with them and you know, dive in underneath them. I'm, I'm on a super juke. These guys are on the full Moto2 bag. So, so uh, it was, there was a bit of fun between our teams, between our test team and the Moto sport team because they were asking us to keep out their way but in actual fact they were getting in our way. <laughs> That's really cool and I think faulted to, to the engine we have a largely unchanged chassis. We've only done some revisions to it to accommodate uh, the new airbox and all of those types of things but generally why, why would we not change the, the chassis on this motorcycle? Quickly, going back to 617, you know, which is our previous generation Super Duke, it was awesome uh, along the street, it was really awesome, very forgiving, real nimble, very easy to uh, agile, but you know, we started to realise that when we took this bike on track and put super sticky tyres on it, like we have here with the Michelin Power Slicks, that uh, you know, we could make it do things a little bit like that, you know, little move that a little bit of movement in the chassis in some cases, on the old chassis. That was just because the technology of the motor was, was moving forward. And we felt that we needed to do something with the chassis, address the chassis, make the chassis stiffer. We did a quick test with the old chassis, bolting parts to it. It sounds a little bit rough and ready, but we needed to know what the stiffness value should be. So we went to Most. I went a second quicker after two days once we started changing the chassis. That number comes back to the factory. The factory measure it find out what it is, then they produce this chassis, we go and test that again, we put a 30% stiffer swinging arm on at the same time with Gen 3, and all of a sudden now we've got a proper, you know, what we feel is, is definitely the best chassis for this kind of uh, torque output. So we didn't need to change it, the modifications that Gaz alluded to are just because of uh, airbox size and volume and position, bigger fuel tank as you'll, you'll talk about. Yeah, and moving from some of the stiffer parts to some of the lesser stiffer parts, we've got an updated WP Apex component on the R model, as well as the updated, and this is maybe the biggest point for us to focus on, is the semi-active technology. Let's first focus on the rear shock. Um, what, what have we changed on some of our SAT? So, SAT, SAT is semi-active technology, and... Uh, this has been an ongoing development process for quite a few years now and you know, we're using it on other bikes like the GT as well but on this bike it had to be something that we could ride in a very sportly way so in other words bring it to a racetrack or very sp a really good sport 74 fast road ready. The, the, this uh, technology basically that we have lately is an updated version from WP so updated hardware, uh, updated software from our, our our internal guys so we're working with them constantly looking at our data on road on street on bumpy roads on wet roads on sporty roads on track so it's quite a comprehensive testing program and then we basically on this shop we decided well okay we've got a we've got an automatic preload adjuster so we can set the bike in auto high auto low whatever you want to do but you can also manually adjust your payload adjuster in 5% increments. Uh, I think, uh, I was checking, I think our, our total from zero all the way to 100% would add about 20 mil of preload. So we add about four mil for normal street riding and that's where you, when you receive the bike, it'll be with 30, 35% preload. That's about four mil. And uh, yeah, the, 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 the Lovely part of, of having this is it's it's very you can individualize it for any weight of rider right now rather than just relying on on internal uh, compression settings and rebound settings. And I mean for me, what I found the biggest uh, advantage was obviously having to 
find my perfect um, preload setting on the rear. I mean, I'm 1.6 yeah. uh, meters tall. I don't weigh a lot, but I was running also at 60, 65 percent, and I felt uh, a lot more comfortable with the bike. Yeah, so Gareth's a fast level rider, you know. So we we, we put in, we we planned about on track. We went to about 60 or 65 percent for a pretty fast rider of Gareth's stature. And he, he found that to work, you know, adequately very well on in track one setting. So that would be your track one setting around right about that. And we've we've got three preset settings for you guys to specifically play with. On track one is, is basically my setting. Yeah, yeah. Track two is more yours. So it was a bit stiffer, so it's it's more for more of a slightly bigger rider. Uh, again, not remember the prelude gesture is only gonna be set at seventy percent on in that. And you can get fit very quickly. We give you a shortcut into the menu, and it's on your favorites button, which is on the right. So, on the sat bikes, which are the Evo bikes <coughs> on that side, you just need to touch once and you go through the suspension. Mm -hmm. Then you can toggle between that track one, track two, have a look at it. You can get into quickly into preload setting, come in, stop if you want, ask if you're not sure. We'll, we'll change it. If you need more preload, there's no problem. You can also go into, we've added another, I've added another one as the week's gone on in Pro 1. You don't need to go into Pro 1 just yet until you've got through the two programs that we're doing in Track 1 and Track 2. In Pro 1, this is, this is really, uh, I mean, way ahead of anything we've done before. So in the Pro, in the Pro settings, and there's three settings, so you've got Pro 1, Pro 2, Pro 3, for your own uh, favorites, if you try, if, if you're at like, one racetrack and you find the best setup, Keep that as that base track. If you like somewhere else, put it in Pro 2 if you like, if it's a bumpier track or whatever, or a faster track, and Pro 3. And in the Pro, what you can do is fork and compression, you've got 20 settings. So in compression, you can go from 0 to 20. Call 4 straight. So, sorry, call, call off the middle, and in the Pro setting it's 10. The middle's 10, so say 9 or 10 is straight. So anything above that is sporty. We set one up uh, with about you know, 14 in compression and uh, about 15 on high speed compression on the rear, um, low speed about 14, so it's a little bit sportier. So again, you can look at that menu and play with it if we've got time. Gives you 20 settings on all of those four, rebound, compression, shock, uh, compression and rebound and high speed compression. And definitely check, especially if you're getting onto the EVA model, just make sure you have a look what setting <laughs> is in there because the motorcycle does remember the previous settings, it does not auto set or reset. So uh, somebody might have played with it already, so just make sure you, you double check on the Evo to make sure where you're yeah. at. Yeah, make sure you have quick setting, quick way in, favorites button, the guy will tell you if you're in track one or track two or that pro map. And that will take you through and help you in, as well as the team with the KTM gear. But moving on, we Obviously, I've seen the blue truck outside, and uh, that's here for a reason, and that's because we've changed to Mitchell and Power GP tires for this year's Super Duke. And um, Jeremy, what I mean, uh, it's it's a hypersport tire; it's not a, a full track tire by any means. But why why would we choose a tire like this? And, and maybe take you guys through what goes into. A decision is it an easy decision or is it something that uh, you need to take a lot of consideration into? So, you know, I think a lot of you know, the, the, the preconceived of the ideas are oh, you, you pick a tire depending on price or availability, or is it on the market? Is it new? Is it going to be on the market for four years? Yes, we have we need a tire that's going to fulfill the lifespan of the motorcycle, so it has to be at least three years homologated, I believe. But that's got nothing to do with the choice. The choice comes from, it's a very, very long and detailed list that the tower has to achieve all of those minimum selection points all the way throughout. So what does it do? Does it, does it handle? Well, a tower that's lighter like this, of course, handles it's a little bit lighter. So it, it helps, it helps the, you know, the change of direction, even stopping and starting distances because that that uh, that tire is a little bit lighter. The same. To to give exact specs, we see numbers of one point two kilograms yeah, lighter. Compared to, to some of the, compared to some of those uh, okay. competitors, that could be like a saving of one point two kilograms in this tire. A little bit like there was, if you remember, on the RR, we used the Park Up too. Uh, again, it was the lightest tire on the market at that time. A really 
complemented the forged rims and everything that we that, that we got out of that our, our model. You know, I still think it was, it was the best motorcycle we, we built to date until we built this. So the the, the list that we we're talking about is everything from how far is the, the this, this hypersports tower lean over in the wet? We measure we measure those those lean angles. We measure the stopping distance. You know, paramount importance is how quickly it stops. So 100 down to zero. This tower can beat other hypersports tires by up to five and six meters. So that that was a big thing for for me. Then of course the. That it does. What, what's the high speed stability of a tire that's lighter like this? Is it to, to be sacrificed any stability? Well, actually, we don't because we load the motorcycle. We go up and we measure the yaw of, of, the, of the handlebar. We take it onto a nine kilometer oval and then we put misuse inputs into the bike. You know, misuse is something that you'd never do. You, you push the handlebars and, and you push the handlebars and you hit the tank with your with your knee at the same time as you hit a handlebar. And then you measure the how, how quickly that bike becomes stable again. I'm glad you got that job. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a very fun job, and no, not, none of the test riders really want to do it, but we have to do it. <laughs> but this, this stability on this tire is really, really good for that. But it also, like lots of other aspects, how quickly does it, does it heat up? How long does it take to get a tire working in a cool condition? And, this, this takes a very short time for it to come up to speed. Yeah. Um, it's durability, of course. Uh, you know, the, 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 the technology that we're talking about with, with Michelin, and Michelin are here, you can go and speak to them about it. You know, I guess that, uh, that, that wet, uh, the, the, the lovely wet characteristics that we get are because of the, you know, Michelin's clever silica technology. They explained it to me one time in Clermont France in France and it went right over my head, but when you're testing the tire, you can see what they're talking about. So lots of, it's a very, very detailed, you know, you can go on talk about tires forever and ever, but at the moment on the street, this tire performs and outperforms mostly everything on the, on the market. Yeah, and further to our parts, we've obviously got the production tire that the customers will essentially get. However, it's not a race tire or something that you're going to go do chasing lap times or anything like that, but we do have three bikes with some slicks fitted, which are pretty much the same compound, just without the cuts. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. A little bit more stability. It's more of a, of a, of a track day tire, you know, it's not full on absolute uh, race slick. It's, it's something that we kind of knew we were going to get mixed by weather here, you know, colder days. And, and let's face it, if we went stuck, the opposition star on that, like a Dunlop, we, we, we wouldn't be using it today because we couldn't keep the temperature in it. So this this tire has, has got a really, the stick that Gareth's talking about, it's got a very, very wide uh, working range and that's on the bar parts bike that we'll talk about, yeah. And moving on, we obviously spoke about earlier a larger bore and obviously this means we create a little bit more torque and some more power, which means we had to make the radiator wider by 40 millimeters just to ensure that the motorcycle runs at optimum performance for all the time obviously but, uh, another really refreshing update for us are the new Brembo MCS master cylinders and obviously not short changing on any products that we've put on but what, what's really cool is the adjustability on the MCS pump now. We have different ratios. Yeah, right. three, like three ratios on that pump. Oh, so, you know, we, we get asked this in the past, you know, well, what ratio is that? Well, I prefer a 21, and well, I don't, I prefer a 19. Well, now you've got your options to play about with on the brake master cylinder, which is a lovely addition, particularly for the track day riders. Yeah, so if you like a little bit more pool, or yeah, know, like more, two, two finger or one more, finger yeah. braking guy, you can. It's exactly right, you know, who uses one finger, who uses full hand, so. You, you've got those options now, it's a lovely addition. And it's really cool. Moving on, we have spoken a little bit earlier about the adaptions to the <coughs> chassis, and obviously this is now where you uh, see this coming. We also have a stripped version behind Jeremy, which you can take a, a quicker look at later on. But we've got a lower profile airbox, and obviously this is now to um, allow us to increase the fuel tank capacity. And um, a big thing that 
and maybe you can touch on the airbox first, but a big thing I'd like to deep dive here is the new electronics. Yeah, I could just put it on it. Um, obviously, bigger air intakes that go with this motorcycle as well. Uh, lower airbox, you know, bigger volume, bigger fuel uh, volume. We've increased the fuel tank volume by how much is it? One point seven liters or something. Yeah. Seven, yeah. So the uh, the electronic side of it, okay, this again on top of everything that we did with the sat guys, of course now we've got uh, an option list quite which is quite in depth uh, on the new electronics. In other words, you know we of course we use in uh, in Supermoto APS we we can have flip over, so we don't suggest you use Supermoto APS on on street the the street APS. We don't. It, it mitigates any flip over the front, over the front. So we had an idea, a great idea, quite a few years ago. Why don't we introduce an anti wheelie mode so that we have different levels? So that on the motorcycle with this kind of uh, mid range performance, it's a, a lovely addition because now we can just program how high we want it to wheelie. So you got five levels. Five levels now. Yeah. So we got very low. Uh, we got low, medium, high, and very high. And you can just, and if you keep on toggling it all the way through, of course you can still switch it off for the photographs yeah. at the end of the day when you want when you want to take home some wheelie shots. But it'll it'll wheelie also in very in high, medium high and very high. And it'll just hold that position, so it it, it won't cause any safety concerns to somebody who's jumping on this motorbike and uh, basically puts it into track throttle mode or whatever it might be and, uh, and then uh, you know goes out and, and, and holds it open in second gear so it's a it's a it's a safety issue or safety safety mechanism that, that certainly is a, a lovely addition to the bike um, the other parts that we have bits and pieces that we have on that obviously are our 10 levels of traction control that we've, we've continued with uh, as usual uh, the other modes that we use on the street which are more important are like we got uh, rain, um, comfort, street, sport. Uh, in rain mode, we limit the horsepower of the motorcycle to about 128. So there's, 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 there's honestly, a, I mean, you could probably spend the rest of the afternoon just talking about the electronics package on the 1390. Also, interestingly enough, is uh, in track and performance mode, it allows you to have the option to play with the anti wheelie on the different levels. Obviously in rain, comfort and street mode there's no uh, yeah. access to this. But that, that comes on the tech pack. Yeah. We, we have uh, now got factory start. Yeah. Which is yeah. A little bit of mix between suspension and the uh, electronics now with the Evo. So on the Evo bike, you know, factory start, uh, again, just going back to our motorsport te technology and what they do, you know, we see that they lower the bike well, for the best getaway, so we included it on the Evo bike. So when you go into factory start, we, it goes to minimum preload setting uh, in conjunction with launch control, the three launch controls that you'll get. And then, as you, you know, obviously, as you take off from the lights or the grid, I would say preferably do it from a grid rather than a set of lights. <laughs> you probably get uh, stopped 20 yards up the road, but the uh, that technology was something I think that was just because because we could because it was there they added that technology and it's, it's a lovely addition we can, you, we can show you later on or you can even practice it yourself if you've got time later on and moving on we obviously spoke about the larger fuel tank capacity but for again referring back to different rider size uh, types we have all sorts of shapes and sizes, testing our motorcycles in the R&D side from people my size to people that are six foot plenty. And um, we need to make sure that uh, the ergonomics on the motorcycle are suited to a variety of riders. So, I mean, it's, it's one of those things that I speak about the best compromises when everyone's equally unhappy. But in this case, we don't have this. I mean, I'm super happy and I see some of our really tall guys are pretty happy. How do we get this right when designing a tank or I, I think that there's that there's always feels to me like there's a little bit more room on this bike than some of our models and I like that because it lets the you know although you're connected to the bike, so what is right or ergo? Obviously we know what the ergo triangle is, you know, how the bike how the how the reach is to 
the handlebar to the seat to the boot peg mm. and we're pretty proud of this one because and the one previous 1290 you know we've, we feel that our go-to ergo is is on the super juke i feel it is anyway it's it, it's really comfortable the seat's super comfortable the vinyl lets you move without sticking to it and you don't slide on it you don't slide backwards or forwards or sideways the fuel tank you know in, in uh, Cooperation with Kiska Design, of course, we spent a lot of time in the clay model trying to get the absolute best fitting Gareth just for for all of those different height riders to fit into. And that's uh, that's something that you'll notice. And I, some riders don't even think about it, but if, if we suggest to think about it, give us some feedback. Mm. Uh, you know, we feel that you fit very well around this fuel tank, the standover position, so we don't get splayed. You know, the standover position is really cool. Riders like Gareth can reach the floor without an issue, without having to uh, worry about the, the height of the motorcycle on the preload setting. Then uh, you know, the lower, say lower handlebar, uh, some little nice touches on it. The, but I think it's still, you know, whether riding this bike on track or riding it on the street, I could ride it on the street all day long, and I have to some days. I have to ride it from morning. Tonight, so yeah, and the seat makes it a little bit better than it. Seats, yeah, just that a different, you know, foam. How we choose the foam and everything is a really detailed process. So we're testing different vinyls one day to the next. There might be five different vinyls to test. There might be five or six different foam levels to test. But this is the one I think that we all we all love. Yeah, very cool. Then moving on, we have quite a let's say controversial topic to discuss and. <laughs> I think it was largely discussed at almost every corner of the planet when we uh, first launched the motorcycle, but even before that, when people started to see some of the leaked spy shots of the motorcycles on test. But we on purpose leaked the KTM Love Anti Duke at ICMA last year in November. And interestingly enough, the, the headlight is shared, um, a shared part between the, the 990 and the 3090 and it was super interesting for me to see the reactions live at the show versus digitally online where they couldn't see the motorcycle so we had, we had completely contrasting so it was one of those that you had to see it um, to appreciate it I suppose obviously not everyone's going to like it and I think um, it, it's not all for looks you know there are performance elements behind the headlight we have obviously designed it in a way to increase the airflow to the air, air box. Um, but the, the like performance is where it really stands proud and stands tall is we now have an adaptive light system where it adapts to different lighting conditions. So it will automatically adjust the level of brightness and which projector beam will turn on, on and off. So you might even see it do this even on the 990 as well. But the biggest talking point is weight save. Yeah, you know it, it doesn't sound like a really big number, but we've saved 700 grams on on the headlight. And Jeremy, what I mean, what does this do for the suspension for weight that high? When, when the engineers tell us something like this, they say you've got a weight saving of 700 grams on top. It's like oh crap, that, that's that's brilliant because it makes the bike handle even more agile. It make, means that the handling is. And the agility just becomes even better because we're taking weight away from the top. It makes a lower center of gravity and obviously makes the light change direction. A little bit like Gav was talking about the tires with the, the lighter uh, hypersport tires. We we notice that a lot. You know, when we lighten our wheels on the R, sorry, on the RR, we notice that. Uh, so any any weight saving anywhere on a motorcycle is a big plus for a rider. And uh, as soon as we went to the lighter headlight, which I love actually, when you see it in the flesh. It looks like it should fit. It fits with that motorcycle. I'd, I'd love to hear all your opinions on too. I, yeah, we think it looks friggin' mean, so it goes very well with the 1390. Oh, so we wouldn't have made it. So, <laughs> but obviously, this now is the official new signature light mask of the Duke Range. Basically, you'll see it span right down to the 390. Uh, but this is the new way forward, and another signature, but just for this year. It is when you start out the bike, you will notice a 30 years of Duke animation 30. that's just been created for this model and will only be for this year's model. So 2024 models will have the 30 years of Duke animation at startup, which is really cool. 
Another cool feature, just quickly before I move on, it does have homecoming lights, so when you switch the motorcycle off, the headlights do stay illuminated in case you park it in a very really dark area and uh, allow you some spray light to, to go. And talking of spray light, we don't have the hard lines anymore uh, during lower light conditions. The motorcycle or the headlight now has quite a lot of stray light that allows the sides to be illuminated a lot more. Uh, which is quite a good uh, step forward in the right direction. But as you've seen with other presentations, we like numbers. This motorcycle is 60% new overall as a total package. And I know my chief engineers and test teams hate when I ask for these types of numbers. And the guy controlling you out of uh, pit lane today, Georg Schamberger, he's the official chief engineer. So the the main guy in charge of Super Duke, and he's going to be making sure you go safely onto track. So, recognize his face. If you have any technical questions, feel free to stop him and, and have a chat to him later. Um, but moving on to some performance stuff. Obviously, we're all about performance, and our partnership with Rams continues. But having a look at the, the left side, we have three, and you've seen them. Power parts, bikes, fully equipped with the latest, greatest, and most offerings that we have on power parts. But Jeremy, the standard bike makes 145 newton meters of torque and 190 horsepower. What do we achieve out of just bolting on a Evo line exhaust? So we, you know, we always talk about these numbers and what's the most important number to me. I'm sure you'll agree. You know, once you start to ride motorcycle with this kind of mid-range power, is that the torque numbers way more valuable than the horsepower number. Yes, of course, when we put this full of a system on that gets closer to 10 horsepower more, so it gets into those sort of bike numbers, but also the five Newton meters of torque that we get from the full system takes it to 150 Newton meters of torque, which I think it's fair to say that I think when you all step off the bar parts bike, you'll, you'll agree that with that you know, full system, a probably exhaust, it, it definitely has a, a fair bit more grunt, but that's what it's designed for, to track only used part. Mm. Uh, the other power parts that come on that motorcycle, I'll just quickly touch on, is the WP Apex Pro. Uh, and again, that the, the, the fork internals and the shock on the, on the Apex Pro are power parts uh, that you can use on track and also on road. Yeah. And we do have Danny here from WP, who's responsible for a lot of the development behind the WP suspension. So he's quite easily recognized. He's in the WP clothing. So uh, have uh, a, a chat with him. He's also got some bare components that you guys can uh, also have a look at. But this brings us to the end of our discussion on the motorcycle. And before we go out and ride, I'd very much like to know, quick show of hands, I know I was on the bus, but who's never been on this circuit before? Okay, so, for those riders, the riders that have, if you can go out first. Go with the riders that have been, if you want to go with me.